I'm Jo Bridgman, Professor of Healthcare Law and Feminist Ethics in the Sussex Law School at the University of Sussex. My lecture is entitled, No Justice Without Care, A Relational Approach to Children's Healthcare Law. The focus of my lecture is the legal framework regulating the provision of healthcare to children. Personal tales of hope and heartbreak brought into the public domain of the court, where individual actions and decisions are subjected to critique by the media influencing the behaviour of other parents and professionals in the future. My argument is that the development of the legal principles governing decisions about children's health care, premised upon a parental right to decide, with court resolution in cases of disagreements, prioritises justice considerations, the conflicting rights of self-interested individual protecting their bodily boundaries from unauthorised interference. The, the reflection, this is a reflection of a liberal rights-based approach to the law, which is then reflected in professional guidance with reference to cases of conflict. And this fails to provide the best approach to the regulation of children's health care and it fails to ensure that parents and professionals work together in the shared endeavour of caring for a child. But I argue that we need to adopt a caring approach, a model of justice that is premised upon care. But I first wish to set the scene with reference to a case which gave much public attention uh, last year, the conflict around the care of five-year-old Asha King. In July 2014, Five-year-old Asher King was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumour. He underwent brain surgery, resulting in acquired brain injury, leaving him unable to move, communicate or to swallow. Postoperatively, he required radiotherapy to the whole of his brain and spinal column to ensure that the cancer cells did not spread to other parts of the nervous system. This risks serious side effects, including cognitive and intellectual impairment. His parents undertook a search of the internet, which revealed to them innovative treatment that is available abroad, proton beam therapy. His parents would not give consent to the standard radiotherapy and chemotherapy. His doctors could not provide this treatment, the treatment his parents wanted, but it is not currently available within the UK. NHS England, applying published guidelines, uh, refused to fund his treatment abroad. A stalemate emerged in which the parties became entrenched in their positions, polarised in their approaches to what was best for his treatment. The doctors could not provide the treatment without the consent of his parents and his parents were not going to give their consent to the treatment that was available um, in this country. His parents believed that threats had been made to take Asher into care if they questioned the treatment that was offered to them. So they removed him without the knowledge of his treating doctors from hospital in Southampton to take him to Spain to raise the funds there. When he was removed from hospital, his doctors were concerned, particularly that his parents didn't know how to administer the food he required via the feeding tube. A European arrest warrant was issued, reflecting a view of the parents as presenting a threat to their child. As she was made a ward of court, which then the court became responsible for all major decisions relating to his care. Some days later, the family were found in Spain, where his parents were arrested under the European arrest warrant, leaving Asher unable to communicate alone and under police guard in a Spanish hospital. His parents appeared in court on extradition proceedings, brought to an end when the warrant was discharged. Asher's treatment was considered in wardship proceedings, the court of public opinion, fueled by the media, first criticised the actions of his parents before switching to vociferously criticise the panicked reactions of the public authorities concerned. Southampton General apologised for the breakdown in communication. Portsmouth City Council sought to emphasise that they were there to support the parents, not to initiate child protection proceedings. Hampshire police, however, refused to apologise for their actions in seeking to trace, to locate Asher. The law, 
which provides the framework for the responsibilities, roles and relationships between healthcare professionals, patients and their parents. Rather than support them to work together in the shared endeavour of caring for ASHA, seem to have been used as a threat and an obstacle to the resolution of the conflict as it emerged. What then is the framework established by the law? The legal regulation of medical practice, the discipline of medical or healthcare law, in its own right, is a relatively recent phenomenon. Medical treatment inevitably involves touching, which in the absence of consent amounts to an infringement of bodily integrity. It may involve matters of life and death. Medical treatment, therefore, is framed by criminal law offences, offences against the person contained in the 1861 Act, or in some cases the offences potentially of murder or manslaughter. Doctors have occasionally found themselves and their practices in the dock, either as a result of challenges brought to their practices by others, or the high-risk strategy, as we saw in the case of Aaron Bourne, of seeking to clarify the law for the future. Historically, there has been very little legislation providing a framework for medical practice, relying instead upon the development of the common law. When the courts reasoning through and explaining their decisions in relation to individual cases, establish the principles that then regulate the professional, parent and patient relationship and guide future practice. In 1980, when there was very little developed common law principles governing medical practice, Ian Kennedy, in his Reith Lectures, The Unmasking of Medicine, said that where questions about medical treatment and care raise legal, social and ethical issues, the law should provide a reasonable, just and rational framework within which professionals can ensure that they are acting in an appropriate and ethical manner, and, I would add, in which we can ensure that parents fulfil their responsibilities to their children. In the context of children's medical treatment, the starting point for the legal regulation is the 1981 case of R and Arthur, which saw the prosecution of Dr Arthur for the murder of a baby, John Pearson, a baby born with Down syndrome who was rejected at birth by his parents. Because of this parental rejection, the doctor respected the parents' wishes and ordered nursing care only and the administration to John of a sedative. The baby John died three days later. The actions of Dr Arthur were referred to the DPP, to the to the prosecution authorities by the pro-life organisation LIFE and the decision was made to prosecute the doctor. Upon his trial there was evidence from the post-mortem uh, which meant that the charge was changed to attempted murder, a charge of which Dr Arthur was acquitted by the jury. Throughout his trial Dr Arthur maintained that his professional conscience was clear as he had acted as a responsible paediatrician recognising and respecting the rejection of the baby by the child's parents. He said it was a matter of parental authority which doctors were required to respect. And then we see the development through the court of the guiding principles in this area of law. Born a month later, therefore following the charge but before the trial of Dr Arthur, was baby Alexandra. Baby Alexandra likewise had Down syndrome and she also had an intestinal blockage. Her parents, believing that the quality of life she would enjoy with Down syndrome was going to be extremely poor, refused their consent to the surgery to remove the blockage necessary to save her life in the genuine belief that this was in her best interests. The doctors concerned referred the matter within the context of the ongoing trial of Dr Arthur to the local authority, who applied to make uh, baby Alexandra a ward of court. The court gave care and control to the local authority, who then authorised the operation. However, because the parents had refused, the surgeon refused to perform the operation, saying it was necessary to respect the parental wishes. It was a question of parental authority. The matter was referred back to the court, and on this occasion the judge concluded that, like the surgeons, the parental wishes should be respected. The matter was appealed to the Court of Appeal that afternoon, 
when the Court of Appeal made the order sought. The Court of Appeal stressed that the matter was now a question for the court to decide and it was the duty of the court to decide whether it was in the interests of the baby for the operation to be performed. Was her life without the operation from being performed going to be ended or if the operation was performed would her life be of intolerable quality? The operation went ahead, the court believing that it was in her best interests. Alexandra recovered and a few months later was returned to her parents' care. Michael Freeman writing at the time stresses the way in which this case demonstrates the importance of an independent principled review of cases concerning treat children's treatment and care. Any review of cases governing the provision of care to children and the relationship between parents and professionals must recognise the central place of the case of Gillick. Finally decided by the House of Lords only by a majority of three to two. Concerned not with the provision of treatment to any individual child, but with the legality of Department of Health advice in relation to the provision of contraception. The case was concerned with establishing whether it was parents or professionals who would have control over decisions in the provision of treatment to children. It established, as is very well known, the concept of Gillick competence, a concept that will be familiar to doctors as well as to law students, although it is much easier for the lawyer to state than for the doctor to determine. For my purposes, what's important about Gillick is that the House of Lords held that parents have a right and a duty to decide whether to seek medical treatment and a right and a duty to give or withhold their consent to medical treatment. But, the House of Lords emphasised, parental rights must be exercised for the benefit of the child in fulfilment of parental duties to the child, which means that they must be exercised in the welfare of the child. Judgments made by parents about the child's welfare can be challenged in and overridden by the court. But before any cases applying these principles in the context of children's medical treatment, there was legislation, the Children Act 1989. The Children Act 1989 introduced the concept of parental responsibility into English law as the principle governing the relationship between parent and child. The Law Commission, upon whose recommendations the Children Act was based, had expressed the, the view that the law then found in the Children Act 1975 did not adequately reflect the fact that parenthood is a matter of responsibility rather than rights, that parents had responsibilities to their children rather than rights over the child. The concept of parental responsibility also sought to emphasise that the primary responsibility for the upbringing of children rests with the parents rather than with the state. Parental responsibility is not given any further definition the Law Commission taking the view that it changes according to the needs and the age of the child. It is, however, a responsibility to protect, to advise, to guide, to nurture and to educate, to look after, to take care of, to raise, to protect the child. But the parental role with respect to children's medical treatment might be considered to be one that was most suited to the development of a distinct concept of parental responsibilities to children. This as a distinct concept, recognising the particular nature of the relationship between parent and child and the responsibilities that parents seek to fulfil to their children, something that we here at Sussex have done lots of research on in the context of developing the concept of family responsibility. However, the courts have retained the concept of parental responsibility as a right and as a duty. As evidence of this, we can look to the judgment of Lord Justice Ward in the Court of Appeal in the conjoined twins case, Re A. The court there was concerned to consider whether it was in the best interests of the conjoined twins that they undergo separation surgery, resulting in the immediate death of the weaker twin, Mary, but necessary for the long-term survival of the stronger twin, Jodie. The parents who had travelled to this country from Gozo 
under an agreement that the British government had with the Maltese government in relation to medical treatment, were refusing their consent to treatment which they said would inevitably kill one of their babies. The judgment of the Court of Appeal traverses principles of English law, venturing across family law, medical law, um, criminal law and human rights law, and a whole range of different principles, including personhood, quality of life, worthwhileness of treatment, um, necessity and intention. It was a truly difficult case. But in doing so, in deciding the case, Lord Justice Ward constructed parental responsibility to decide as a matter of parental right, the parental right to exercise their parental responsibilities in relation to decisions concerning the child's medical treatment. Lord Justice Ward said that emphasised that if a doctor is to provide treatment to a child without the consent of that child's parents, the doctor may commit a civil trespass or a criminal battery. But also stress that the parental right is subordinate to, parent, to child's welfare. That, the, that once the case came to, before the court, the court then had overall responsibility to determine the welfare of the child, or in this case, the welfare of the babies. And the view of the court in this case was that the parental decision was not in the welfare of the babies they gave consent to the separation surgery, which was performed with the consequence that Mary died. So this case establishes the employment of parental responsibility within a rights-based framework. Although the case suggests that the rights of the parents could be overridden with scant regard for the parental concerns about the provision of necessary medical treatment to the surviving twin, or the discrimination that she may confront upon her return to Gozo. With reference to pre-Children Act cases, when this might have been the occasion, 10 years before the passing of the Human Rights Act, 10 days before the passing of the Human Rights Act, to speak of children's rights, or to explore parental responsibilities as responsibilities rather than as a right, duty or authority. Now, doctors uh, will not be familiar with the detail of the, of the principles of the law, but they are provided with guidance as to their legal obligations by guidance provided by professional bodies, guidance which seeks to reflect the law and ethical practice. So by looking at the professional guidance, we can gain an understanding of what professional bodies think are the key messages from the leading cases. The first example is the British Medical Association Guidance on Parental Responsibility, which emphasises parental rights to consent to treatment in the best interest of their child, explains that parents are not entitled to insist on inappropriate treatment or to refuse treatment which is in the best interests of the child, that court intervention may be necessary if parental decisions are considered not to be in the interest of the child. So here using the language the courts adopt of rights rather than the language of care, emphasising the opportunity to resort to courts rather than encouraging the exploration of alternatives which might not be so conflictual. The GMC in their guidance uh, specifically relating to children's treatment emphasises the complexity of the law. It advises consultation with medical defence unions and employer solicitors for advice on how to deal with a particular decision. Although they advise if parents are refusing treatment, which is in the best interests of the child, they should involve a number, another member of the multidisciplinary team or an independent advocate before seeking legal advice. Most recent is that from the Department of Health, which seeks to offer a guide to the English law and consent not confined to issues concerning the treatment of children. It emphasises the legal and ethical principle of consent as respecting the right of the patient to self-determination, failure to respect which may constitute a civil or criminal battery. The guidance emphasises that doctors must comply with the Human Rights Act and seek legal advice if they are, have any doubt about the legal validity of a decision, if there is a continuing disagreement or a conflict, then they should refer to the courts. So rather than seeing the significance of consent to the shared endeavour 
of parents and professionals to ensure the best quality care for a child. The key messages are the parental right to consent that doctors cannot treat without consent from the parents and that courts should be involved if there is a disagreement. That the framework that the law establishes does not best ensure the care of the child or support parents and professionals to work together in the interest of the child can be illustrated, I suggest, with reference to one of the two cases concerning children's medical treatment in the Department of Health Guidance, the case of David Glass. This centred around a 12-year-old boy, David Glass, who underwent a tonsillectomy to help deal with his breathing problems. David also had serious physical and mental disabilities. He was cared for at home 24 hours a day, seven days a week by his mother with the assistance of family members and with the assistance of community services with occasional resort to, to um, hospital in cases of crisis. David developed an infection after his tonsillectomy which proved difficult to deal with and resulted in a number of hospitalizations over the following months. His, per his mother disagreed with the doctors who then formed the view that David was now dying, that aggressive treatment should not be provided, rather he should be provided with palliative care um, to assist him in his passing. His mother was of the view that he merely had an infection as a result of the tonsillectomy. The disagreement escalated into a conflict. The trust, the NHS trust, used the law as a threat. A meeting to discuss his treatment was held in the presence of the police. And when his mother said, well, if they were right and he was dying, she would like to take him home to die, she was told that if she did, she would be arrested. Here what we see then is a breakdown in trust, showing the extent to which trust had broken down. And also the trust, the NHS trust, betraying a lack of sensitivity to the family whose child his doctors believed was dying. A child who depended upon his mother for care to be her, his advocate and his protector. A mother who had particular expertise arising from her experience of caring for her son, but who depended upon doctors to provide care to him in the crisis that had occurred. Despite her disagreement, diamorphine was administered to David without the mother's consent and a DNR note put on his, his notes without her knowledge. The trust had sought legal advice, which was related to the doctors, and then recorded in his notes. Legal advice demonstrated here, which suggested that the doctors could treat as they considered to be best, overriding his mother's refusal, ignoring her role in consenting to medical treatment. Legal advice, which was a partial account of the law, which failed to reflect the difference between the cases that had gone before and the facts of the case um, before them. The law here, I would argue, is polarising positions, entrenching their differences, ensuring that the parties are engaged in an adversarial battle in which the full armoury of the law is then employed in order that one view or the other may prevail. When the law should encourage parents and professionals to work together in partnership in the shared endeavour of caring for the child. The focus upon the care of a vulnerable and dependent child whose well-being, personal integrity, dignity depended upon the mother who cared for him, who in turn was dependent upon the doctors to provide care at the point of medical crisis. Now the legal advice in Glass was based upon early case law. Cases in which the court was asked to decide upon the provision, the withholding or withdrawal of treatment from a child with a life-limiting condition. Hence the use of initials in the names of the cases, protecting the anonymity of the parties and the privacy of the child and their family. These early cases, although we still have them today, there was no disagreement. These cases can turn children who are in care because their parents were either unable to contribute to the decision about the child's care, or they agreed with the treatment plan, or they were uncertain about what was best for their child. In all these cases, the local authority has referred the matter to court 
to ensure the legality of the planned care, to obtain the authority of the court to ensure that in the withholding of treatment, no offence is committed by any of the doctors, and also to secure an independent assessment that the provision of palliative care and the withholding of active treatment is in the best interests of the child. However, inevitably, we then have cases in which doctors disagree with the decision of the parents. These cases here, the decision in which the parents are refusing their consent to treatment that is recommended by the doctors. The law here, as the cases have and the professional guidance have made clear, the law here is very clear. If doctors disagree with the parental decision, the decision cannot be overridden. If the decision of the parents is one which the doctor cannot in good conscience accept, then the doctor, the trust, must refer that to court for, for determination. The law then, however, draws the parties into an adversarial battle, polarising positions, rather than emphasising the shared endeavour of caring for the child. The principles that are applied in making decisions about individuals then developed into, into guiding future cases, un influencing the understanding of what is required of the parties. And what we note is that in all of these cases here, with the exception of Reti in 1997, the court formed the view that the parental decision did not reflect the best interests of the child. The court forming that view primarily on the basis of the medical evidence and without consideration of other factors, other factors that parents may place greater weight upon, including the consideration of the child as an individual with a distinct, unique personality, character, tolerance to medical treatment and intervention, and attitude to life. Without consideration to the parental experiences, their knowledge of their child gained as they care, focused upon the well-being of the child. And without consideration of the dependency of parents upon professionals providing treatment to their child at this moment of medical crisis. But then even more problematic are cases of disagreement over ending of life prolonging treatment. Parents in these cases refusing to agree to the cessation of medical treatment, believing that their child does still enjoy a quality of life with professionals concerned to end the pain and suffering in the context of the inability of the child to express the pain and suffering and the inability of doctors to do anything to address it. The Department of Health guidance cites the 1998 case of RIC, emphasising that parents with parental responsibility cannot demand a particular treatment to be continued if the burdens of that treatment outweigh the benefits. That if parents and professionals cannot agree, then the matter must be referred to the court. The Department of Health guidance, however, continues to say that the court will authorise the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment against parental wishes in exceptional circumstances. That the views of parents are given great weight by the court and are usually determinative unless they conflict with the child's best interest. Now that fails to acknowledge that in the vast majority of cases that that is exactly the conclusion that the court reaches. With the exception of the case of Re-MB and occasional judgments in relation to the care of Charlotte Wyatt, that is what the court decided, that contrary to the parents' views as to whether the child's life at that point was intolerable the treatment of the child should be ended. So here we have cases in which the court is deciding that the child's life should end without consideration of the child as an individual, an individual with a character, a spirit, a personality, without consideration of the knowledge and experience of those caring for the child, not only the child's parents, but also the nursing staff without consideration of the context in which medical care is provided. Cases in all this list, which is not just a list of cases, these are 
um, circumstances in which babies have died as a consequence of the order of the court. And if parents are not personally persuaded that this is in the best interest of their child, they must be left with uncertainty about whether they did all they could to protect their child at a point at which they most need the support of those sharing the responsibility for the provision of care. Which brings me back to the case of Asher King and the question whether the law has created a reasonable, just and rational framework within which professionals can act in an appropriate professional and ethical way and parents can fulfil their responsibilities. Or do we see, in the case of Asher King, rights, responsibilities and relationships structured by the law, framed by a justice without care approach? As Virginia Held has argued, to focus only on justice or only on care can lead to uncaring justice and unjust forms of care. There was no doubt that this was a difficult case, decided under a pressure of time very much in the public eye. However, the judgment of Mr Justice Baker gives very brief consideration to the law in paragraphs 29 to 31 of his judgment. There is reference to the paramountcy of the welfare of the child, the need to regard the child's rights under the European Convention or the Human Rights Act, but an emphasis in paragraph 31 upon the primary responsibility of the parents. Mr Justice Baker decided that both treatment alternatives, proton beam therapy and standard radiotherapy and chemotherapy, were reasonable and it was the parents who bore the very heavy responsibility of making the decision. In his view, there was no business of public authorities, including the court, of interfering with their decision. Now, of course, it is the case that in the majority of situations, parents will be those who are best placed to make this decision. But that does not mean that public authorities, including the court, do not also have responsibilities to children. They have a responsibility to subject the decision of parents in difficult cases to independent and principled scrutiny. What we have here in the case of Asha King is a very high profile case which will affect the understanding of what is possible in relation to medical treatment, but also of the legal obligations of parents in securing the best treatment of their child and also the obligations of professionals, public authorities and of the courts. Since the decision of Mr Justice Baker, doctors providing treatment to children with cancer in the UK has said that the prominence and coverage of the case is causing other parents to question the advice they are given about the medical treatment available to their child and to encourage them to seek proton bean therapy. The concern is that as NHS England did pay for the treatment, the impression is given that proton bean therapy is better than the treatment available to the child in the UK. And that any opposition to this treatment is simply a matter of cost cutting or a rationing decision. But given that the treatment was ordered by the court, given that Mr Justice Baker gave an order that ASHA should be provided with a proton beam therapy as long as funding was available. Once the court had ordered this, the NHS had no option to pay. Where this high profile case raises questions for other parents, if it results in delays, it makes it more likely that the child's cancer will return and the survival rates of children's cancer where they return is very low. So a decision that's been made about one individual child and that was best for that child could have very damaging consequences for other children. So the decision in the King case was, of course, primarily about the treatment that Asher should receive in his best interest. But the decision of the court will not only affect this one child, it will provide a guide to practice and may lead parents of other children to question the care creating within them cause for concern about the treatment their child is being offered and a possibility of conflict over treatment given the policy of NHS England not to fund in such cases. 
Despite the Children Act 1989 emphasis upon the primary responsibility of parents or parental responsibility constructed as parents' rights, the responsibilities of parents need to be understood in the context of the parental dependency upon others caring for their child, others who have responsibilities to the child arising from personal and professional relationships. And it needs to be recognised that the law has a role to play in supporting those people to fulfil the responsibilities to children and to work together in the shared endeavour of caring for a child. As Gillian Carol Gilligan has observed in a different context, the law may give individuals a legal voice in a matter of relationships, but frame that voice within a framework of rights such that issues of relationships become very difficult to hear. When there is no doubt that these are important and difficult decisions which need to be framed by reference to caring relationship and dependencies. I think it requires us to consider what it is that the law is regulating here. These circumstances must be paradigm examples of caring. Care work both parental and professional. Carol Gilligan, whose work is the basis for much feminist theory of care and responsibility, identified an alternative mode of reasoning to the dominant frame, the dominant frame in terms of the abstract application of rules based upon assumptions of individual individualism, separation, the concern to protect the individual freedom and self from aggression by others, i.e. the rights-based framework. The alternative that she presents is the self as foremost connected, concerned to fulfil responsibilities, to um, act in response to relationships to which responsibilities arise regarding the needs of others. In other words, responsibilities not as rights, but as relational. As Jonathan Herring in his excellent book, Caring and the Law, argues, what we need is a model of justice premised upon care, a caring perspective focused upon how it is that we can best, as parents and professionals, meet our caring responsibilities, and ask of the law to fulfil a role in creating, fostering and supporting the provision of high quality care, working to maintain the essential connections in the caring relationships, rather than, as I have argued that it does now, operating to sever them. Hugely influential for me in developing my thinking on this issue in the, is the evidence of the parents to the inquiry into the quality of care provided to children undergoing paediatric cardiac surgery at the Bristol Royal Infirmary between 1984 and 95, chaired by Professor Sir Ian Kennedy. This was very important in bringing to public attention the neglect of children's health care services against the concern of parents to secure the best possible care for a child who required life-threatening, life-saving surgery. The evidence provided to the inquiry from the parents emphasised that in the overall provision of high quality care, what was important to them was that their child was respected as an individual person not as a medical condition, a unique individual with a character, a spirit, a personality. What was also important was respect for parental concern for their child, the parental focus upon the well-being of their child, but also the expertise they had, the knowledge they had of their child as a consequence of their relationship of raising the child. And recognition of the extent to which they were then dependent they had to make decisions to entrust the care of their child to a professional and they depended upon these professionals to take care of their child in the same way. I argue that we need a model of justice that reflects the kind of evidence that the parents gave to the Bristol Inquiry. A model of justice that is premised upon care. Care for the individual child which recognises the relationships, responsibilities of both professional and of parents. 
that recognises the dependency of parents and professionals upon the other's provision of care, that recognises that the ability of parents and professionals to care will depend upon public and social responsibilities to care, state provision, facilities, funding, research, training, the absence of any environmental factors that make it difficult. I argue that we need a legal framework which fosters and supports parents and professionals to work together, bringing their own expertise and perspectives and experiences to the shared endeavour of caring for the child. I argue that we need a model of justice promised upon care because there is no justice without care. <laughs>